It was 1983 in New Orleans, Louisiana. I was nine years old and I'll never forget the day. It was summertime and I can remember my mother as she did most days was laying across her bed and she was praying. Whenever my mother was praying, it was always uh, a scary situation to us kids because she prayed really hard. And most times we would either go in, in our rooms and be very quiet, or sometimes we would go outside and play. And I remember this day we were outside in the backyard playing. What you need to know about me is at nine years old, I was what I thought was an experienced pyromaniac. I had been playing with fire for years, uh, putting alcohol on my hands and setting them on fire, watching things burn, taking pieces of paper to our gas stove and, and watching, watching them burn. I, I, I just loved fire. And I had played with fire many times before this day. But this day would be different. I can remember I had a box of matches. And in our backyard, it was a fenced-in yard, we had a big tree, a magnolia tree. And I remember uh, this day, there was a gas can that sat under that tree. And in the 80s, there were no plastic gas cans really uh, most of the gas cans were metal and i had done what i had done this before i'd taken a match and stuck it inside this gas can and uh, watched the fire as it would shoot out the nozzle uh, it seemed like a blow blow torch and it was it was just always exciting for me to see it and I remember this day, my brother and my sister uh, was in the yard with me. My brother is six years younger than me and my sister is seven years younger. And I I'll never forget, I was taking the match and I struck it. And I stuck it in the nozzle of the gas can and uh, I expected to see a fire come shooting out of it. And, and nothing happened. There was gas in the can. The match was lit. Stuck it in, but nothing happened. Um, and I thought this was unusual. But being nine years old, I really didn't understand how uh, gas and fire and water worked. And so uh, in my child like mine, I figured I better get some water and try to put it in this gas can just in case there's a fire on the inside that I don't don't see. And I remember grabbing the hose pipe and I, I pushed my brother and my sister out the way and I grabbed the hose pipe and I turned it on and I walk over to the gas can uh, and I, I look down to see how to stick the, the nozzle in, uh, the hose pipe in the nozzle. And as I did that, the gas can exploded. Boom! I'm bent over this gas can and it, as it explodes in my face. Heat like I had never known before. It's the middle of summer in New Orleans, and if you know anything about Louisiana heat and humidity, there, there's really nothing like it. It, it. Summer days can be painful. And I, I just remember taking off, running out of the gate, I ran across the street, I just didn't know what else to do. I was in so much pain. And, and there was a man that happened to be walking down the street at that very moment. And he saw the whole thing and he grabbed me. 
uh, and he took me to my front porch and he rang the doorbell. And I can remember when my mother came, she uh, evidently had just got off her bed after hearing the doorbell ring. And she came to the door and she looked at me uh, in this man's arms as he's holding me. And she simply said, boy, you're burnt. Immediately, she, she ran and called our neighbor. Uh, we called her Mim, one of my mom's best friends in the neighborhood. And, and my mother at the time didn't have a vehicle. And I remember Mim uh, said she would take me to Turo Hospital, which, which was really just blocks away. Um, and Mim came out of her house and jumped in her car and it was right across the street. And uh, they rushed me over to the car. And I remember getting in the back seat of the car. And, and as I got in the back seat, immediately I realized that the heat on the outside in Louisiana was a lot better than the heat on the inside of that vehicle. And so my face is burnt and it's burning uh, because of the heat that is outside. And when I get inside this vehicle, the pain uh, is excruciating because now the heat from the inside of that vehicle uh, is hitting my face. And it was just nothing like it. It was torment uh, unlike anything that you, you can ever imagine. I, I'll never forget the pain. And I remember uh, going down Barone Street and taking a left on Louisiana Avenue, headed towards Turo Hospital. And, and, and I, the pain was so intense that I, I rolled down the window and stuck my head out. And there was a car as I stuck my head out that saw my face. And, and, and the lady that was driving, she swerved. Uh, I, I guess I frightened her. Uh, and I can remember, uh, it seemed like it was forever, but it was really just minutes that we pulled up at the hospital. Uh, my mother ran in, they, they got me out. And when the nurses saw me, they immediately jumped into action. Uh, I was put on a gurney and I can remember uh, them taking me and they begin to take this ointment and spread it all over my face. And, and they had these uh, patches that they was putting all over uh, some type of gauze that they were putting all over me. And I remember at that point, I realized that what I did was very bad. This is not like any other day. This, this is, I've messed up many times before, but I've really messed up this time. I, I'm in so much pain and, and the doctors are, are coming and the nurses are, are moving frantically. And, and I can remember just looking up at my mother and I was thinking, I'm going to die. Because a nine-year-old shouldn't be able to endure this kind of pain. And I looked at my mother and I said, I'm sorry. That was all I could say is I'm sorry. I've really messed up this time. And uh, I don't really remember much after that. I do remember waking in a room and this room was it was different than any hospital room I had ever been in before because uh, I was frantic to see my face and I realized that in this room there was no mirrors anywhere not in the bathroom uh, nowhere I I wanted to see what I looked like. I wanted to see the damage that I had caused to myself. But I couldn't, I, I couldn't find a mirror. I remember I made up in my mind that day that I was going to find a way to see what I have done. Uh, I took a stroll down the hallway looking for a mirror. Couldn't find a mirror anywhere. 
And I remember uh, I was on the burn unit at Two Row Hospital and uh, there were other kids in the area where I was and there was a, a playroom. And I, I departed from searching for this mirror because now I see toys and I see kids and 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 I don't know what they gave me for the pain, but uh, the pain wasn't quite as bad at this point. I, all I know is that I was told that I had first, second, and third degree burns all over my face. Uh, the only thing that didn't burn was my chin, but uh, my hairline was back here and uh, my face was just burned and it was, it was puffy. I could see uh, my cheeks had exploded. So I could see that it was real damage. I just couldn't see my whole face. And, and I wanted to see it because I knew it was bad. But I'm intrigued by this play area. And I'll never forget. I opened the door. And I walked into the play area. And there were kids that were in that room. I remember one kid specifically must have had a burn on her arm because uh, she had this these gauze all around her arm and she was playing and 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 she specifically I remember when she turned around and she looked at me she began to scream and 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 once she started screaming all the other kids turned around and they looked and 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 they saw me. And, and and they begin to scream and 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 it was kids just screaming in this room and I remember a nurse ran in the room and grabbed me and she said you can't go in there and I was like I can't go in there only thing I want to do is play she took me to my room she said you can't go in there with the other kids and I don't know if at that point I even knew what depression was, but if a nine-year-old could be depressed, I was depressed that day because I realized that what I had done had affected me so much that I couldn't even be around other kids. It had to be bad. I, I, and I was... Uh, I wanted to see it even more now. I, I must see my face and and... I, I began to search again and I had to be careful now because now the nurses know that I'll roam out of my room when I'm not supposed to. And so I was very calculated, but I, I, I was going to find some area where I could see what I had done. I remember my mother uh, came and she, she bought me these little books the highlights where you're trying to find uh, different things within the picture. And and I remember this one little thing she bought me was the Dukes of Hazards. It was uh, a background and then they had stickers and then you would take the stickers and you would put it on this background to make uh, some type of scene. And, and I remember doing that and I had a little bit of fun doing that by myself in my bed, but uh, it wasn't enough. I wanted other interaction with other kids and, and I, I couldn't have that and I wanted to know why. And I remember one night, I didn't hear any nurses at the desk and so uh, I decided this is my time to go find that mirror. And I remember uh, walking down a hall and I came to a point where there was a restroom and this restroom uh, appeared to be for uh, for the anybody who was visiting in that hospital and I walked in and I can remember there were about uh, three or four sinks but no sink had a mirror on the wall I said now this is crazy and and I had to use the restroom for real and I remember going into a stall and I shut the door, and when I shut the door, there was a mirror on the back of the stall. And all I could remember 
was seeing this ugly green monster. And I began to scream and I, I was trying to get out of the stall and I had an IV hooked up to my arm. And so uh, I'm sitting there with this IV and I'm trying to get out of the stall because I see this monster. Its face is all bloated and big and it looks like it has little bumps all over it and it's it's just uh, disfigured. And, and, and I, I finally made it out of the stall and the nurse comes in and, and I remember she grabbed me and she said, what's wrong? And, and 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 I said it's a monster it's a monster and and she grabs me and she's taking me back into that stall and I'm trying to fight her to get away and 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 she looked at me and she she has me in the mirror and she said baby the monster is you It was at that point that I realized the magnitude of what I had done. I realized that I'm going to be disfigured forever. Not long after that, I remember a doctor coming in. And in the 80s, technology wasn't in the hospitals like it is today. Uh, he bought a little film strip into my room and began to project it on the wall. And I can remember him going over with my mother and with me the process that I was going to have to go through. He bought in some tools to show me uh, and her what it was going to be like, how uh, at some point there were going to be scrapings of the scabs and uh, I would have to have plastic surgery and showed me uh, different things about skin grafts and, and, and it was alarming. Uh, was something that I wasn't facing, uh, something that I didn't want to face. And I can remember realizing that you can do things that can affect your life forever. A lesson that I'm learning in a very powerful way at nine years old. I used to sleep on my stomach at night and uh, I remember them telling me that I couldn't sleep on my stomach because he was afraid that I was going to do more damage to my face. And uh, I, I remember, I, I'm not sure if it was that night, but if it wasn't that night, it was probably the next night that uh, my mother was there in the chair and I got a knock on the door and in comes some of the saints from our church. At the time, we went to two churches pastored by the same uh, man, Pastor John Cupid, the late John Cupid. Uh, we would go to the first church on Sunday mornings at 10, and then we would go uh, to AOC, Apostolic Outreach Center, uh, at 2, and then we would go back uh, to First Church for service at 6.30. And we did that every Sunday. And there were some people from the Apostolic Outreach Center and the current pastor, Pastor Raymond Watson. I remember him uh, being in that group that came to the hospital. And my mother had called for the saints. And I remember them coming into the room. And uh, I don't remember anybody gasping. It was almost as if uh, they were trying to make me feel as normal as possible. But I can tell you what I, I remember most from that night. I remember them joining hands around my bed and then begin to pray for me in the name of Jesus. Um, as a nine-year-old, in my situation, I was in, in need of desperate prayer, but uh, I didn't understand the power of what was actually happening in that room. And I remember them talking to my mother and encouraging her and uh, her letting them know that her trust was in the Lord and that I wasn't going to be this way forever. And in my mind, I, I didn't know if any of this would work. I was just, I was depressed. 
I, I couldn't have any interaction with any other kids. Uh, I looked horrible. It, it was it was just a trying time. And I remember one night, my mother fell asleep. The nurses weren't at their station. And I walked out of the door of my room into the hallway. And uh, my room was right next to the nurses station. And then there was a, another room on the other side of the nurses station. And I remember as I'm passing the nurses station, uh, there's a room there and there's a, a little girl who comes to the door uh, and she begins to talk to me. And, and I asked her her name and she told me her name was Maria. And I remember talking to Maria for hours. I mean, she was the only kid in the burn unit that wasn't afraid of me. She sat there and talked to me and, and it, we struck up like a, a, friends, a friendship. Uh, and I, I remember going to my room that night. I, I, I was happy again because now I have somebody I can talk to. And I remember uh, I wanted to go to sleep so I could wake up early because I wanted to go back and to talk to, to Maria. And I remember uh, the next morning I woke up and uh, I got out of the bed and I was going to Maria's room and I had to pass the nurse's station. And the nurse asked me, she said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm going over here to this room because uh, I want to talk to Maria. And she looks at me and she's like, She's like, nobody is in that room. And I said, well, no, the girl that was in there last night, she says, nobody was in that room last night. And I was like, yes, there was a girl named Maria. She was in that room because she talked to me. And she was so confused because she told me nobody had been in that room for a couple days. And I was confused because I knew for sure that I had been standing at the door of that room talking to this uh, little girl named Maria all night. And I went back to my room and I, I never uh, saw Maria again. We never had any contact after that. It was only uh, as an adult. One day I was recalling that night that it, it came to me that as a nine-year-old who now understands the gravity of his actions and has realized that uh, he has thoroughly messed up and is in a position where even other children don't want to interact with him, that the Lord sent me an angel that would interact with me. Now, I know I'm going to go against some people's theology right here because uh, I know some people say, well, all angels are, are men. And, and I don't know if anybody believes in children angels. All I know is I spoke to Maria for hours one night, went back to my room. And the next morning I went back to talk to her and I was told that nobody had been in that room for days. And I know for sure that I talked to a young lady a young girl. And so uh, God placed somebody in my life who wasn't afraid, didn't see the scars on my face, didn't see all of that, but uh, embraced me and talked to me. And uh, I thank the Lord for that because as a nine-year-old going through what I was going through, that was exactly what I needed. And I remember uh, shortly after that one night, I went to sleep. And out of habit, I can remember, begin to turn. And, and I went to sleep on my stomach. And when I woke up the next day, the pillow was nasty. There was scabs all over the pillow. I mean, it, it had the worst looking gunk gook, whatever you want to call it. I mean, I'm not trying to be graphic, but it looked like pus was all over it. And um, 
And I can remember that when uh, the doctor came in to see me, he was alarmed because he didn't understand what had happened. I remember him seeing my face and it, it was almost as if he got angry because he, he said, what happened to your face? And, and, and my mother explained that I went to sleep on, on my stomach. And when we woke up, there were scabs all over the pillow and, and he was upset. I mean, he did a lot of looking at my face and, uh, he had to come to the conclusion that there was nothing that he was going to be able to do because whatever I had done in the middle of the night had had practically healed me. Well, I mean, me sleeping on my stomach uh, didn't heal me. I know that it was when the saints came into that room and, and locked hands and began to pray in the name of Jesus that I was healed. Uh, and I remember, I mean, from that point on, he wasn't very nice with my mother. He wasn't very uh, nice in his tone with the nurses because uh, he realized that he's not going to make any money because I, I didn't need any plastic surgery after that. Matter of fact, my face began to heal so rapidly uh, that in less than a week, I was on my way home and I remember they were sending me out into the sunlight. And so uh, what they told me was that I was going to have to wear this mask. Uh, sent me to a place to get a, a Job's mask. I'll never forget it. J-O-B-S-T. It was a mask that uh, I would put on my face and it just had the eyes, a little spot from my nose and my mouth out. Uh, and it had Velcro that ran around the back and it looked like uh, a very thick stocking. And I remember going and getting fitted for this mask and uh, they, they gave it to me and they, they put it on me. And, and I didn't live far from, from Turo Hospital. And so when I got the mask, I was going to walk home. And so I put this mask on my face uh, and I'm, I'm walking from Turo Hospital back to my house on Barone Street. And I'll never forget that I had to cross St. Charles Avenue. And there is a lady who was standing waiting on the streetcar to come. And as I'm crossing St. Charles Avenue and I, I get on the neutral ground and, and the lady is standing there and she f feels my presence coming up behind her. And when she turns around, she sees a little kid with a mask on and she grabs her purse and she began to cuss me out and she was screaming at me. I guess she thought I was going to rob her. And it, it startled me so bad that I, I remember I just took off running and, and halfway home, I took the mask off and, and I made up in my mind I wasn't about to wear this mask because somebody's going to hurt me thinking that I'm, I'm a robber or, or, or trying to hurt them. And so I refused to wear the mask, even though I was out in the sun in the middle of summer and, and they were telling me that it was going to, uh, it could possibly hurt me to be in the sunlight. Uh, really, to be honest with you, the only time I put that mask on was when I was trying to scare my brother and my sister or some little kids in the neighborhood. Other than that, I never wore it again. And, and it never had an effect on me. I want you to understand that, you know, I, I'm telling you this story because I want you to understand the power of our God. When we say that God is a healer, for many of us, we're not just saying that because we read about it in a book. We're saying it because we have experience with God. You know, this this is really just one testimony in my life about how God has healed me miraculously. God is healing people all across our world miraculously every single day. And so we are going through some trying times right now and, and people are afraid of what coronavirus will do. I'm here to tell you today that God is a healer. Most people, well, well, really all people, nobody ever knows that something happened to me 
by looking at me. It's only when I tell them what happened. And and the reaction most times is when I first tell somebody about me having third degree burns all over my face, first, second, and third degree burns all over. The first thing they do is they begin to inspect my face. They want to look around and try to see if they can see. Does he bear any scars? And they can't find one. And I, I can remember this, that years later, I burned my arm on a heater because uh, back in the 80s, we didn't have central air and heat in most homes. We had little heaters. And I remember burning my arm on a heater. And you know, for years, I bared the marks of that burn. And it was just a small burn. But it was on the marks of that burn was on my arm for years. And it stood there as a testament of the miraculous power of Jesus Christ and how he healed my face. I, I want you to understand that uh, we may go through some things in this life. It may be some things that happen through no fault of our own, or it may be that we actually caused it. But guess what? We have a God that is able to heal and to deliver us out of whatever we're going through. And so uh, I want you to be encouraged that should something come and knock on your door that you wish never did, you don't have to worry. You have a God that is able to heal you. You have a God that is able to deliver you. You have a God that is able to take those things that have happened and to erase them like they have never happened. And so uh, there are all types of challenges that are going on. The first challenge I can remember was the ALS challenge, what uh, they called the ice bucket challenge. Uh, and since that point, there have been many different types of challenges. And so I want to challenge you today. Let's do the testimony challenge. Let's testify about the greatness of our God, because uh, my miracle is probably a little small miracle compared to what somebody else has gone through. But I believe our world needs to hear about it. And so uh, today, I'm encouraging you all, begin to upload some videos about what God has done for you. Let's tell the world about how God has been doing miraculous things in the lives of his people. In Jesus' name. I thank you all for listening to me. I know this is a long video, uh, but I just felt impressed to do it. And so I thank you for listening. Until the next time. Love you.